All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We have a new name for the podcast. It is now the Lore Lads, mainly because differentiating between the Lore Lodge official podcast and the Lore Lodge was getting irritating. Lore Lodge official podcast is a long title. I uh, didn't really think that through when we named the show originally, but we uh, we are super excited to be back. We were thinking about coming back last weekend and then remember that somebody else came back that Sunday and that was probably more important to observe. Uh, so... <laughs> Brought it through here, and I'm super excited because the Yuba County 5 subject kind of popped off over the last six months to a year. Um, you know, we have a video on it. I think Missing Enigma did one almost a year ago, and Wendigoon did one six or seven months ago. So the topic has been getting a lot of attention in this sphere more so than usual. And uh, so we we reached, or I think, Tony, you reached out to us, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I saw your uh, YouTube video and wanted to make sure I was getting in touch with the people who were really digging uh into the case and talking about it publicly so just wanted to you know connect with people make sure we could talk yuba county five yeah yeah so tony reached out to us and we were psyched you know i mean i i always love finding somebody i can talk to who makes what i know about something look minuscule by comparison <laughs> um you know a lot a lot of what we do here at the lore lodge is we we take all of the authoritative sources and we combine them into one and give people a summary of the the body of knowledge so it's nice to be able to bring somebody on who is really acutely familiar with it not just in the way that they've read a lot but they have written something on their own so what i wanted to ask you tony is you know if you want to introduce yourself and then uh you know tell us a little bit about why why yuba county five grasped your attention in the way that it did so to the extent that it, it brought forth a book Sure. My name's Tony Wright. I'm the author of Things Aren't Right, The Disappearance of the Yuba County Five. It's probably what some people have considered the Bible for the case, uh, a 1978 disappearance. And the way I ended up writing the book is no one else had written a book on the subject. And I found out about the case probably around 2018 because of criminally listed and bedtime stories. They both had videos on the case. And, I, you know, I follow true crime and unsolved mystery content on YouTube and also follow podcasts of, you know, similar nature. When I first heard about the case, I thought, wow, that's really interesting. I want to read a book about the case. Nothing was available. <laughs> so I talked to a friend of mine who had published books and we were working in the comic book industry at the time, part time. And he asked me about the case. He said, tell me about it. What, what was it about? So I just shared with him my thoughts of your, you know, I gave him a, information on the case and shared my thoughts about what could have happened. He said, you know, go for it, write a book. And we were talking about the case in 2019. And I thought, you know, 2020 is a good year. You know, I've got really nothing going on. I could probably finish up on a couple of comic book projects and just travel and, you know, go to California and research this case. And that didn't happen, but I did spend <laughs> that. I did. I did spend that year doing a ton of research and you know, with the Yuba County Five case, it's the disappearance of five friends in 1978. Four of them had intellectual disabilities and one person had schizophrenia. So I thought there was more to the case than what was being presented on, you know, some videos and podcasts and there were articles and I decided to do the deep dive. And when I went into the case, I thought, man, I don't know if there's enough to write a book that's 200 pages. Uh, I'll be really stretching it. And by the time I got to 200 pages, I thought, I could do another 200 and my editor's like, Whoa, so slow down there. We got to take some stuff out. That <laughs> so was the I experience I had doing the video. I was like, this probably yeah. will be like, you know, 15 pages of notes, 30, 40 minute video. And, and that'll be it. And then it's like, Oh no, there's 15 pages of notes just on the geography of this area. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you don't really realize what you're getting into until you're there. So you have the story of the men that go missing and the case and then their backgrounds and then the center where they went for people with disabilities and then you got the plumus and the witness and then all the things that law enforcement was dealing with. And it turned out to be just a huge deep dive. And you can go down all these rabbit holes with the case. And yeah. I mean, for those people who aren't familiar, I mean, it was February 24th, 1978, when these five friends traveled from Marysville, California, North to Chico. Uh, they had a straight shot uh, to Chico because they wanted to see a basketball game at Chico State University. Their favorite team is UC Date was UC Davis. They had an away game. They decided, hey, you know what? We'll go to the game Friday night, and then Saturday morning we have our Special Olympics basketball tournament. 
And this game will be like a huge um, morale boost for us. It'll kind of be sort of like almost a pep rally of sorts where we'll go to this game and we'll watch our favorite team win. And then the next day we'll go down to the Sacramento area. We'll have our tournament. And if they won that tournament, they'd get to go to the main California Special Olympics tournament at UCLA. And that was a big tournament where tickets include uh, it included tickets to Disneyland. So these guys are really excited. And what happens is they go to the game, they stop at a convenience store and then vanish off the face of the earth. And their car is found like four days later, 70 miles up in the Plumas National Forest, uh, 70 miles in the wrong direction and on an abandoned road. And, you know, on a, on a road that was covered in snow and nobody could understand how these guys got up there because they, they made this trip to Chico many times. They've been to Sacramento many times. They could travel well together as a group, but for some reason that night, everything went wrong. And so this book is a way to examine the men, the case and theories about what would have happened to them that night on February 24th, 1978. Yeah, that's and, and as I was reading through, I didn't have a chance to, you know, read the entire book, but I was able to skim through several of the chapters and uh, take a look at, you know, there were a few chapters that specifically dealt with stuff I didn't have a ton of time to look at, one of which was the Gateway Project. So I wanted to, you know, get get some information on that. And I wanted to talk about that with you as well as a couple of other things. But I just really quickly, you know, you had said uh, you had said you were going to work on a few comic book projects. So I just want to bring that back really quickly. Like, so sure. you have a, I assume then you have a background in writing. Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, I'm a liberal arts major, so you're going to get dumped a ton of research papers on you in school. So that helped out. But around uh, 2010, I started doing work in web comics. And then that turned into a work with comic books with a company called Source Point Press. They're based out of Michigan. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I had put some comic books under my belt along with a graphic novel. We would go to conventions around the United States, which was which was really cool and meeting comic book fans. So you can't go wrong with that, going to comic book conventions and selling your comics to people. Um, so yeah, having a background in writing was, was important. And then my full-time jobs in archives and records management. Gotcha. That that involves a ton of research. Yeah. And going through old, you know, like microfilm and newspapers and old reports. So I, I've got a background in research and writing and I thought, yeah, I can handle this book. I mean, how hard could it be? But <laughs> when, when you start writing a true crime book, you've got all these people to interview. You've got all these sources to dig through and police records. And I mean, so much stuff, it, it becomes overwhelming and it turned into like a four year project for yep. me. I'm just, I'm glad the book's here. Yeah. I'm, I can imagine that's gotta be a, a sigh of relief when you find it. <laughs> done. Yeah, that's, absolutely. That's, I do it on a weekly scale, so I can only imagine how it feels after years. Um, but yeah, yeah, so I, I, I wanted to kind of start with uh, with with going through the story quickly. You you gave a, a quick little summary, but just to, to go back through it really quick, the the parts of the story that generally tend to uh, confuse people, that give people this, like, the, the mysterious aspects, really are after they leave Chico, so far as most people understand. It's them getting there, them watching the game, they stop into a convenience store, what happens after that is usually the part that everyone looks at as weird. There's this trip 70 miles out of the way. They have to get off the highway for no reason. Nobody knows why they did that. And then that road that they drove up had at least six miles of unpaved road in a direction none of them would have known to go for any any known reason. So what I wanted to kind of ask was in in the research process, how true did you find that to be? Was there anything that came up between them leaving the basketball game and them just kind of disappearing. I, I've seen some people bring up uh, like there, there may have been a fight at the basketball yeah. game or something like that. So were there any details that, that you were able to corroborate? Not in a police report. So I actually went to Marysville to look over the original case files and then they sent me redacted case files electronically. But seeing the original case files and the redacted case files, nobody came forward to say there was a fight in the parking lot at the game or at the convenience store they were at afterwards. So the big sort of like missing link in this case is that trip from Bears Market until the point they get to that abandoned road near a place mm -hmm. called Rogers Cow Camp in the Plumas. We've got no information about what happened. We can only theorize why they exited the highway, drove to a town called Oroville, mm -hmm. and went up a road called the Oroville-Quincy Highway. 
which led them, gosh, up to maybe some 4,000 feet yeah. up into the foothills uh, of the Sierra Nevada mountains in the Plumas and on a snow covered road in the middle of nowhere. Really for no reason. Like there's yes. nothing up there that they could possibly have been going towards. Except there's the one, there's the one little anecdote that I think it was Bill Sterling's family had stayed at a cabin up there. Um, right. Like eight years earlier. Yeah. What was the town? Uh, uh, Bucks, Bucks Lake. Lake. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's it's a nice little lake up there and you, there's tons of cabins and, you know, people go up there for vacation, but of all the five guys, so there you have Ted Weir, Bill Sterling, Jack Madruga, Jackie Hewitt, and Gary Mathias. They like doing stuff outdoors, but only during the summer. They seem to yeah. be more like swimming and maybe just throwing the ball around, but they would do stuff like play mini golf and go roller skating and bowling and basketball. They weren't ones for winter sports. They weren't ones for snow or the cold. I mean, some of them would go up that way for fishing and hunting, but and maybe swimming, but not for nothing in the middle of winter, especially when they had like a really bad winter um that year like they're having now in california where they just get like you know it seems like 50 tons of snow dumped on them every week um I'm so yeah right. i mean pennsylvania it's, it's, i'm so used to you know three feet of snow in the winter and we got nothing this year yeah i, I you know i live along the great lake so we're you know we're we're ground zero yeah. for lake effect snow and yeah none for us this year but that year i mean it was a bad year weather-wise for snow and where they were up in the Plumas, there were some areas that probably had what 10, 15 feet of snow drifts. And these guys are going to a basketball game in Chico wearing tennis shoes and jeans and, you know, lightweight jackets. And I think Bill Sterling had a leather jacket and one guy had like a corduroy jacket. That's it. And they go up somewhere that's below freezing snow and they're going to walk through all this. I mean, I know you guys being from Pennsylvania and me being from the Midwest, you just don't do that. You're not prepared for that. And that's, that's a bad, bad decision doing yeah, it's, that. It's the kind of thing you do as a teenager when there's two feet of snow on the ground and you want to go to the convenience store and not something you do at midnight on a mountainside. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well out of your way from anywhere yeah. you're trying to get to. And, and I think one thing that's also kind of overlooked by a lot of people when they look at this case is that both Ted Weir and uh, Gary Mathias were, had, had military training. So they would have had... Jack Madruga. Jack Madruga. And, sorry, not Ted Weir. Yeah. Yeah, Jack Madrugo. Yeah. I believe he was a truck driver, right? Yeah, he served during the Vietnam yeah. War. And I don't, um, I don't recall Gary's job in the military. I don't know what he did, but he was sent to West Germany to be stationed. But unfortunately, with yeah. suspected drug use, and this is when his schizophrenia becomes an issue. He's discharged. I, I don't know what he did in the military. Yeah, a lot of these military records kind of get get a little classified and it's hard to get information so i know also there was a pretty big fire at one point um i'm not sure if it would have affected after vietnam but i know that like when i was looking through uh all the military records yeah i yeah i, I remember when we were looking at the uh the charles mcculler disappearance which nick missing enigma actually ended up changing my mind on um when we had him on to talk about it a few or a couple months back um because initially i was like oh this has to be about foul play and then you know, him being the kind of guy who, like, will just go to Crater Lake and hike around himself. He was like, well, if you look here, 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 and it's like, oh, my God, he really did fall into a ravine. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, I, I have been wrong. It's happened. Um, But what I wanted to kind of, you know, that's what I was thinking is, like, when we were looking at that, his dad, Charles McCuller Sr., is a ghost in, in terms of records. The guy is having senators write back to him, but no record of what he did in the military, just that he was in it. Um, so it's, it's weird going back to like that mid century period, trying to dig stuff up because there was definitely a lot of the government just being like, oh, well, nobody's going to know if we hide this or, you know, if it burns up in a fire, who's going to care. Um, but where I wanted to go next was actually something I read in the theory section of your book, which was regarding the amount of gas in Jack Madruger's, Jack Madruger's car. Uh, you said, I believe there was a quarter of a tank found. Right. So when this car is abandoned. Uh, the men leave the car, but when it's found four days later, the keys aren't in the ignition, but they can hotwire the car easily. And when they get the car started, it has a quarter of a tank of gas left in the car. Mm -hmm. I worked with uh, some people from Mopac Audio who did a Yuba County 5 podcast. So they took all the data they could on a 1969 Mercury Montego miles per gallon. Mm -hmm. uh, so how much could the tank have? when it's filled to capacity and if they drive to chico and back 
how much gas should be left in the car. So they probably would have come back or were the point they were. They should have had probably a quarter of a tank or I'm sorry, half a tank Mm -hmm. and not have gone through three fourths of a tank. So at either at some point, we don't know if they filled the tank up 100 mm-hmm. percent or if he just decided well i'll just fill it up to this point and then i'll come back because you know i don't need to use that much gas tonight so if he filled it up at a quarter of a tank did he have you know three fourths of a tank full when he left it, it's really hard to tell um you, you know people when they sort of do car trips i mean some people fill the tank all the way some people you know let it yeah. go to e so it's hard to tell, but it doesn't make sense for him to have a quarter of a tank if he had a full tank. But we know that that car was stuck there and there was another car up there that was stuck. So one thing I've tried to think about is the amount of gas he put in the car or could someone have gone up there and siphoned gas out of his car because other people had been up there. You said they should have, in getting from marysville to where they ended up they should have used half a tank he said somewhere in that ballpark what uh what about it was there a consideration for the fact that they were driving uphill for a large portion like would that i don't think in any way now that you mentioned we didn't take that into consideration probably because you're definitely going to burn more gas especially because of those roads winding and then i don't know how much running your heater could be taken into consideration and things like that. I don't think it's going to be that much of a game changer. Also, we don't know if they left the car idling for a bit of time. That was my next question is, do we have any sense of like, did they leave the car immediately versus did they sit in the car for a while? Cause I know that initially they thought the car was stuck, but then I read reports, news reports that said that they determined the car actually hadn't been stuck, but it was, it was stuck in like six to five inches of snow. And as you guys know, with a lot of snow where you are, you know, you get stuck in snow. You can, there's things you can do to rock your car out of the snow. Or if you get to a point, if you got people with you, how to push the car out of the snow. So we don't know what happened once they got stuck because Mm -hmm. the tires had spun according to the uh, members of law enforcement that saw the car, but we don't know how long they spent in the car because the witness who we can't really say is reliable said they immediately got out of the car and went into the woods right which doesn't make any sense but if they were stuck up there i would assume they probably would have just sat in the car for a little while trying to figure out their next move yeah that that was the other thing i wanted to ask was about the witness you know because because shones is he's kind of the town drunk but at the same time he's the only guy who could reasonably have seen them that night so you know what what were your thoughts on his statements and for for those who maybe you know just forget what happened or anything like that. Uh, he had a couple of different things that he said, one of which was that um, there was a car that he had driven up because he was trying to check where the snow line was so he could see where he could take his grandkids or something to play, which didn't really sound like a legitimate reason to be up there at all, uh, or to continue driving into the snow line if all you needed to do was see where it was. Those were issues that that came up during the search. I think, uh, I think Nick also mentioned that. But, um, so his story's kind of weird. There's, you know, it doesn't make sense why he was up there necessarily. He says he got stuck for a little while. He tried to push his car out. He had a heart attack because of the stress. You know, he laid there for a second, managed to crawl into his car. And sometime later, another car rolls up and he calls for help. But then I think it was either everybody got into the car and drove off or everybody scattered. I can't remember the exact details off the top of my head. Um, and in one version, there's a, it's a red pickup truck. In another version, there's no pickup truck. In one version, there's two cars. In another, there's, he says there's between two and a dozen people, and maybe there was a woman with a baby. So there's a whole bunch of weirdness here. And then, of course, there's the stuff he says to, uh, the couple that drives him home in the morning from, from that one bar from, I think it was like the mountainside bar and grill or something like that. Um, yeah, where he, he doesn't say anything about the stuff that he later tells police. So I guess what were, what were your thoughts on, on Shone's story and you know, what you think actually happened there? Boy, Joseph Shones. I mean, when I first heard the story, I thought, man, this poor guy having a heart attack on this road and their car pulls up. And, but then you think a little bit like, what are the odds? Because after I drove, I, I made two trips up that way into the Plumas. And every time you just can't help but think, what are the odds that these two pe- these two cars meet each other mm-hmm. in the Plumas late at night around probably, I don't know, 1130 midnight? 
this is the middle of nowhere. People, I mean, there's some people living up there, but not a ton of people. It's sparsely populated. It's a deserted road. It doesn't go anywhere. And Joseph Jones had been drinking at a couple bars and he drove north of this place called Mountain House. It's this lodge, this bar that where people hang out up there. And he gets his Volkswagen stuck in the snow. And when he leaves the place where he's been drinking beer, the lady running the place thought, why is he going that way? He's going to get stuck in the snow and no one's going to be able to see him. Mm -hmm. So he gets stuck in the snow. He pushes his car and he must cause so much stress that he said he had a heart attack. And then he gets back in the car, probably what, four hours later, five hours later, either the Montego or the Montego in a pickup truck behind it, come up the road and this is where the stories change. Either the people get out and get in the pickup truck and drive away, or they walk up to his car and start flashing flashlights in his car and not say anything. And he's apparently telling them, help, I've had a heart attack, please help me. And they walk away. Uh, another story is he just sees the Montego, all the guys get out of the car and they just run into the woods. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you've got that starting with Shones of stories and he's the last person to see him alive and he's not the most reliable narrator in this story so whatever whatever we know from shones i mean i don't even know what percentage of that story we can take as truth and how much of that is sort of exaggeration and i met one of his neighbors or i talked to him on the phone a few times and he said the guy was always spinning the story and would dig himself into a hole with the story because I mean, it was just nonsense coming out of his mouth. And with Shones, he kept talking to the press and said he had a heart attack and he did this and did that. And you're right. He did go back to Mountain Lodge the next day. And he walked in and said, I should have done this two years ago. He says nothing about a heart attack. He asked for a ride home. He asked he for mentions, a couple of aspirin. That was yeah. It. And then he just, you know, sits there and is like, Ugh, I don't feel good. But he... But if you have a heart attack and, you know, he tells the press he thought he was going to die, I think he would probably say, you know what, you better, someone better drive me to a hospital or something. But, I mean, he gets there and says nothing about the guys that disappeared or a truck and wants someone to drive him home. So he goes home, goes to bed and his wife and daughter show up and they're like, where's the car? What did you do? And he's like, oh, I got it stuck up the mountain. So they have to go get it. And they spend like two days getting his car. And then once people find out about Shones, the press starts talking to him. And if you start reading all of his article, all the articles that interview Shones, you're getting to see he's got all these different stories and you don't really know where to keep things straight. Mm -hmm. Because at one point he's like, oh, you know, this was what happened to me. And then this is what happened to me. But then he contradicts himself in other stories. And it almost seems like he wants to talk about himself and not about these guys disappearing. And when the law enforcement talks to him and they interviewed him twice, to my knowledge, both times they noted all he wanted to do was talk about himself. Mm -hmm. And if you started to ask him questions about that night and what he saw and what happened to those guys, he got irritated and flustered and just didn't seem to care. Yeah. I mean, the, the conventional wisdom with something like that is that the witness's first statement in, in cases like this guy, is probably going to be the most accurate. I mean, obviously, there's a difference if you go through and you sit down with a, you know, a, a psychologist and you do cognitive recall and things like that. That's a little bit different. But when it comes to somebody who, you know, is known to be a little bit of a, a tall tale spinner, that, you're, that first thing they say is probably what you're going to see. The other thing that occurred to me is, you know, when, when somebody is involved in a killing like this, if, if it was intentional, often they will insert themselves into the investigation, which was something that I kind of considered, like, was this guy responsible? Did he snap on these guys for some reason and cause them to drive or run off into the woods? But even then, it doesn't explain how the car ended up there in the first place. Um, and, and that was yeah. kind of another thing that I wanted to ask about, because if we go by Shone's timeline, which is, of course, dubious on its, at, at, just from the, from the jump, he says that this encounter happened around midnight. And right. if they left Chico at 10 p.m., getting to where they were by midnight without, you know, on, on unfamiliar, unpaved roads 
is they're they're really going about as fast as you possibly can. Like that is yeah. They have made no wrong turns. They have gone directly there. They have driven the speed limit the entire way. And one thing that uh, one of the officers, one of the deputies said was that he couldn't imagine how anybody could drive up that road at night in, in general and not damage their car unless they were familiar with it. Yeah, so one I'm time I drove about that. Yeah, one of the times I drove up that way was, you know, after sunset. So it got dark. There's, I mean, you're up there. It's pitch dark. So and the roads wind up into the Plumas National Forest. And once you get start getting close to the area where they abandoned the car, the roads were gravel at the time. Now they're paved, but the road where they went up to abandon their car is still unpaved to this day. And you're right, it's a rutted road. And you would have to carefully drive up that side road just to get to where they abandoned the car. And it's not like they just pulled in and got stuck. They actually went up a road. And if this is a logging road that goes to the middle of nowhere, I mean, what were they thinking with this yeah. road? And when you drive up into the Plumas, there's these areas on the side of the road that they have like extra, almost like curved lanes where you can basically turn around and go somewhere else. And there's even homes and mm -hmm. a couple of bit, like there was like a fire station up that way. And even with Mountain House, just pull into the business, turn around and go back to where you started and just fig just get back to Oroville. I mean, that's all they had to do is get back to Oroville, get on the pay phone. And if they were lost, they would have just said, hey, we made a wrong turn. Sorry, we're running late, mm -hmm. but we'll get back on either Highway 70 or Highway 99 and we'll be home. Yeah, there's I definitely want to talk about so Aiden. You look like you had a question. Yeah, you know, it was more of a comment uh, just in terms of the timing as well, because I know we were saying the you know, for what Shones was saying about them getting up there roughly around midnight, if we're going to take anything that he says at face value, even in the slightest, you know, you're thinking about obviously the conditions of the roads at that time being unpaved and with the snow all over the place. Hang on, sorry. Uh, but you also think about the type of car they had. Not only is it an old, old car with really like antiquated suspension, it's going to be difficult to not damage. But with a carbureted engine at that time, you get up into higher altitudes, you're losing power pretty quick. Uh, mm. especially, you know, you know, the, the cold temperatures as well, you know, it's going to be difficult the higher you go, not only just with the snow, but with the power that you're going to get out of the engine. And especially with fuel and economy, like we were saying earlier, you're going to burn more gas and, you know, trying to get up higher. So it's really, it's just a weird scenario all around with that car. Yeah. And you guys are right. I mean, the time that he gets up there or he says they get up there probably, is off because we don't know if he had a watch on him or if he's just guessing my time. Um, but you're right about making that trip from point A to point B, because I've theorized that when they, when they got off the highway and off, I believe they were taking highway 70. If you know anything about California, there's two state highways out of Chico, mm -hmm. 99 and 70, 70 seems to be the closest. It's the closest to Oroville. So you can just, you know, exit off into Oroville, mm -hmm. drive to the city. But that's that th there needs to be an explanation why they went into Oroville. And we've thought about maybe they had to use the restroom because they stopped at a convenience store and they were mm -hmm. drinking pop and milk. And who knows what if they had something to drink or eat at the game. Or maybe someone wanted to use a payphone because they were supposed to call someone or maybe they were going to tell family members uh, of a change in plans and maybe dropping someone off at home. So I, my whole thought is some, they knew something about Oroville where they could stop and use a restroom or, you know, Gary Mathias smoked, maybe someone wanted a pack of cigarettes um, or they wanted to use a payphone and tell someone they were running behind. One of those three seems absolutely plausible, but like you're saying with the trip going directly from point A to point B, and you guys are right about those roads up in the Plumas, it's not like it, it, it's one of those trips where you can just, you know, be going 55, 60 miles an hour because once you hit uh, those roads in the Plumas, you've got to be going like 30 miles an hour in some spots, maybe 25 if the roads get a little bit snowy or icy, um, just so you're not, you know, sliding into stuff or anything like that. And if they were driving in the Plumas and they'd see snow and pine trees and signs for the Plumas, all they would think is, oh man, we're in the wrong place. We got to turn around and go home. They didn't do that. Yeah. I, and that's the other thing that I think, you know, everyone knows that these guys were all a little bit intellectually disabled, but we're, we're not talking about, you know, inability to, to do things on your own. Several of them had out of the home jobs. 
Gary Mathias himself was of average intelligence. He just had schizophrenia. I, uh, mm-hmm. but of course, and that's, you know, something that I've been seeing pop up in the chat a lot is a lot of people have suggested that, that Matthias was responsible for it. And I do want to get to that, uh, in a minute, but first I wanted to touch on, on one, a couple of other aspects related to the, the time of their disappearance and the possible reasons. Um, one of which was if we just look at, you know, Shones being up on the mountain, one thing that I, I couldn't find any evidence for, so I didn't bring it up in the video, but that did occur to me was could he have possibly been going up there to purchase something illegal, like a, a weapon or a uh, you know drugs of some sort? Obviously, it would be it would be possible. Um, oh, free group calls have a limit of one hour. That's new. I'll have to figure that out. Um, we'll just have to restart okay. the call. I think in fifteen minutes, which will be that's awkward, fine. But you know, did, we'll do it. Yeah, it's weird. That should have been fine. Maybe the. Uh, I think this is a new thing because we've never run into that. Yeah, we've never had, had calls that go like before. three hours long. Not a problem. We had our call with Isaiah go three hours long without a problem last week. Yeah, that was like two weeks ago at most. Yeah, Google's um, changed. Although stuff that was just two like... people. That was just two people. That's probably why. I thought we had the the premium thing that allowed it, but maybe not. I'll take a look and figure it out. Who knows? Uh, either way, um, <laughs> you know what I wanted to look at was the possibility. You know, did did you come across anything that would suggest that? shones could have been evolved and i'm not suggesting the guy was like a kingpin but maybe he right. did you know go and and buy a, a couple ounces of, of weed every every couple weeks and could this have been a thing where like maybe he maybe they drove up behind him while he was purchasing something and then mm. they were run off the road or uh they were threatened or something is, is was there any evidence that that could have been what happened I mean, there's no evidence, but it is a good theory because the Plumas, there was a story in the Sacramento Bee about a year or two after the guys went missing that the Plumas was a hot spot for illegal marijuana growing. Mm-hmm. And there were reported meth labs up there used by biker gangs. Plus, there was quite a bit of violence linked to the drug trade up there because if you were growing your own pot, other people would come in and try to steal it from you. Or, you know, you have that meth lab and maybe there'd be some bad blood between biker gangs and there'd be some sort of retaliation. I, I believe Shones was up to something that night and he didn't tell the truth because he wanted to see the snow line, which is bogus because I've heard from people, Joe and his family were not the outdoorsy type. And he yeah. said he had a winter cabin up a summer cabin up there. That was his residence. Yeah. Um, because his identification and information at the time hasn't linked to Berry Creek his wife was in the Sacramento area with the, their daughter, but nothing records wise shows them in that area. So yeah. whatever they were doing, they were doing, but yeah, there's a lot of sketchy stuff going up in the Plumas at that time. And I've talked to people who lived up there recently and they said, yeah, there's still a bunch of sketchy stuff going on from time to time up there today. But yeah, I mean, Sean's is up there doing something. We just mm-hmm. don't know what it was. And he's used the explanation of wanting to see the snow line. He could have just asked someone. Yeah. Or he could have stopped he, short of the snow line. Yeah, he there was would have no said, reason oh, he needed okay. to drive into it. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's ridiculous. So yeah, and I saw you, I know someone had a question on you're you're thinking about uh, I don't know if one of you guys had a question or Yeah, so I was thinking so that kind of leads into a thought that I had a little bit earlier when you were talking about some of the uh backgrounds of the guys. Who was it that you mentioned that had the drug problem? Because this leads Gary. me to think Gary. So is it possible that that's why they were going up there? That they, there was a potential drug deal that they were trying to, at least one of them may have been persuading the others to come with, or, you know, that's, that's the reason for the detour? That's a good question. And that's been brought up before. But in talking to people that knew Gary, they said when he was on his medication for his schizophrenia, even drinking alcohol would make him like, not make him like feel really sick. Uh, um, but According to his family, he really wasn't, he, I, they don't think he was using drugs at all at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can't, I mean, would they have driven all the way up into the Plumas to get it? Because looking at the newspapers of Yuba City and Marysville, doesn't seem like it was hard to find drugs there. No. Uh, they, so, I mean, that's a good question. We, I had talked about that with some people, but people who knew Gary said, nah, he really wasn't doing anything like that at the time. They said he really didn't like to drink alcohol. The other guys, I mean, they had, they would have a few beers here and there, but they weren't, I mean, that was super rare. And, you know, 
it's something about Jones up in the Plumas. I mean, we know he has a history up there of being up to no good, but what he was doing, we're not sure. But um, the trip up there to get drugs, I think, might be a stretch for the guys just because it's a huge detour. And I, I'm sure those guys could have found pot very easily yeah. in Marysville, Yuba City, because that place was something else at the time. So then that's another story. Because yeah. as Madison, you talk about. Real quick, correct me if I'm wrong. In your research, didn't you find that uh, Gary was it's supposedly not long enough for it to matter? But that he was off of his meds for a period of time, or am I misremembering? No, you're, it was that he would have been off of his meds, progressive, like they, like there had been occasions where he was off of his meds. But uh, in this case, it was only that I was basically making the point that after they went missing, after a certain period of time, I see, I see, without his medication, he would slip into into a a schizophrenic episode. Right. Um, and those could be, would be extremely violent, according to the people that knew him. He would become very dangerous, threaten people, like, it, it, it was not. And there was the one instance where he, like, walked from Oregon back to, uh, Yuba City. Uh, hmm. I, I forget how he ended up in Oregon in the first place, but that was... His grandma lived up there. Right. So the other yeah, thing... Yeah, it's like 500 miles. Yeah, it's a long walk. <laughs> but... It's a... The, the last thing I wanted to talk about before we go into into some more detail about where they all were found and Gary, you know, the, the theories that since he's never been found that he might have been responsible, I wanted to quickly go over uh, the fact that there were allegedly sightings of these men in both Oroville and I think Brownsville um, mm -hmm. in the yes. days after they disappeared before the vehicle was found, or not before the vehicle was found, but before the search was initiated. So there was, you know, the, the Oroville sightings, I believe, by, were by a motel manager. Um, mm -hmm. And then the Brownsville sightings were by a, a grocery store owner and, or a grocery store manager and a, a patron of that store. So right. obviously, if we're looking at this, the car is definitely up on that mountain by 9 a.m. on the 25th, uh, right. I believe, is when it was, when it was actually seen um, by, I can't recall the guy's name, but there was a, a resident in the area who walked up and he saw the car and he... He reported it, but they figured it was no big deal because people would sometimes go and go skiing or hiking around in the area and just leave their cars. Right. Um, but that means that they were out of the car by 9 a.m. on Saturday the 25th. Right. How then and... is it that they end up being seen down in Brownsville, which I think was like an hour away by car, right. and Oroville kind of simultaneously? Yeah, someone thought they saw maybe a few of the guys hanging out behind a hotel. And then the Brownsville story is really interesting because they're in a red pickup truck mm -hmm. wearing different clothes. Three of them are in the truck. Two of them are by a payphone talking to someone. One of the people on the payphone is Jackie Hewitt, where if you know anything about yeah. Jackie Hewitt, he said that he didn't care to use the phone. And if he, the only people he'd want to talk to would be his girlfriend and maybe Ted Weir or someone. Mm -hmm. But different clothes they're south of where the car is abandoned and they could be close to home and so, if they had access to a payphone you'd think that they would call somebody to ask for help right and the thing is the families had put together money for a reward leading to information about the discovery of the men so i think the money that they pulled together worth today around 10 grand something yeah. like that so if you're hard to cash 1200 bucks a little over 1200 bucks yeah, so it event so where it's at, um, financially for people at the time, it was definitely like dangling a carrot in front of people saying, Hey, what do you know? So everybody came out with a story, and with law enforcement, they're drawn 60, what about 50, 60 miles south of where the cars found, and it's actually east of where they lived. And families were like, Well, they could have called home and we could have gone and picked them up. If they had access to a payphone, and if they had a truck, they could have driven home. Mm -hmm. And so nothing about this was making any sense whatsoever about the discovery. And I think they claimed that they were in the place Saturday and Sunday or Sunday and Monday. And if they're making two trips for food, I mean, where are they getting the money to make all these trips? I mean, they had some money on them, but it's not like they were carrying like yeah, no. 50 bucks or anything on them. I mean, they just had enough money to, you know, get to the game and come home. I mean, uh, probably the equivalent of you know handing your kids 30 bucks today <laughs> like yeah yeah exactly and 
it, it's it it was so strange to see them you know at this other place and that sighting was totally bogus unfortunately and it, it took investigators down that way unfortunately to actually see how credible the source was and to, you know look over the area and i mean they had no choice but to look over that area when they're actually back 60 miles north and they should have been looking at that area instead i mean they had some people up that way but not a ton of people right yeah it's it, i, I kind of netted out in the same place that these sightings seem like they were either mistaken or you know at best mistaken and at worst deliberate misdirections um either because people wanted the reward money or because people knew what had happened and were trying to you know protect somebody but even then i couldn't connect the people in brownsville with anybody who would have been up in the plumas um, right but that brings me to kind of you know the last the last little mystery here um which is how basically why did they leave the car and how did how did they end up dying why did they die uh gotcha. with them and, and you know with them leaving the car we have a general idea that they kept walking north and then they walked right or they would have headed east off of the road and then down an access road that eventually led them to uh to these trailers and mm -hmm. i believe it was madruga and sterling are found about six miles from the car right um in terms of how far they had walked uh right. just kind of like on on one side of the road a little bit apart from each other it looks mm -hmm. like they died of exposure like maybe one of them got tired and the other refused to leave them something along those lines uh no right. sign that they had any physical trauma like that they have been attacked um then you have uh ted weir is found in the trailer in right. a pretty miserable state he's got gangrene in uh, his his legs um there's also some other weirdness about the trailer but we, we can get into that in a second jackie hewitt is found uh, i think like a mile east of the trailer right yes and exactly. then gary's just never found so right. my my first question is because there were there were a few different theories about this who do you think actually made it to the trailer based on the evidence we have and based kind of put my head together with a lot of people it seems like gary matthias ted weir and jackie hewitt made it to the trailer that I think what I thought. I think you. I think you're right. I mean, I'll go back and forth sometimes, but I think what happened is either Bill Sterling or Jack Madruga had something where they collapsed. Um, it's brought up in the files of the unexplained. If you've seen mm -hmm. it on Netflix, where they say due to hypothermia, you're going to have this tiredness that's going to take you over, and you're just going to, you know, fall down. And we think that happened to one of the two. And what happened was when Gary, Ted, and Jackie made it to the trailer there could have been some sort of discussion of one of them is going to go back and look for Ted and Bill and try to get them back mm -hmm. to the trailer, see what happened to them because there's like towels and blankets and stuff heading towards them that are found in the mm -hmm. woods. So someone had a plan thinking that they need to, you know, take care of these guys. But with Gary not being found, the, the theory is he went out and, you know, if it was hypothermia and that's causing confusion could cause hallucinations it, i mean you know not having any water having any food not having his medication it was probably like this perfect storm for just you know gary's just unfortunately dying somewhere in the plumas it's a huge area it's 1.1 million acres and there's areas that people just really can't get to there and we think that's where gary may have gone off to um into the plumas and that's where he perished and no one's been able to access that location and i think jackie may have known that ted was in grave danger and may have tried to leave to get help and that's what happened to him unfortunately he passed away too so you know they're found in june uh the the four uh around from the sixth until the 10th and the investigation was called off on the 19th and they had no signs of gary they had no idea where he was yeah, it was, uh, that, that was where I netted out with it too, was that maybe they, you know, those three made it to the trailer and then Gary said, be it being the most intelligent and the, the one best equipped to go on a long walk, Gary said, I'm going to go try and get help. Um, now ha the, the kind of follow-up to that is, cause this is another thing where Nick and I, Nick and I seem to disagree is he made the argument that I believe he made the argument that gary would have left uh immediately or sorry no that gary did not leave immediately that gary stayed okay with, uh that gary stayed with 
uh, Ted for a while. That I think he says that Jack never made it, and that Gary stayed with Ted for a while until he realized he needed to go and get help. Otherwise, right. they were both going to die. Um, I think that Jack made it to the trailer. I believe it was probably Jack who cared for Ted. And then mm. Gary, within the first couple of days, possibly the first few hours of being back in the tent, um, was the one who went to get help and that he, you know, went to get help immediately. Also, uh, for whatever reason, the call is about to end. So give me <laughs> one second and we'll just get this one. We'll get everybody back in here. All right. One second, everybody. Start an instant meeting. Add others. Oh. There's Ian. Uh, oh boy, wait. Where is... Where's Tony? Where's Tony? Uh, give me one second, guys. Just got to get this fixed, because for some reason Google hates me today. Um, just sending Tony over the meeting link. We'll see when the boys get here. Guess I'm alone. I'm all by my lonesome. So very sad. Will they ever arrive? When will my husband return from war? Truly a tragedy. A travesty of the highest order. Ah, there we go. There's Tony. Question is, where where'd we lose Aiden to? I don't know. Um, let's see. Also, why am I so small? <laughs> Uh, let me text him really quick. Uh, yeah, I don't know why, uh, why this is suddenly happening for us. It's these things do happen and they just kind of throw these like curve balls at you when you least expect them. Yeah. It's annoying. Also, like now my tiles are all screwed up down here. <laughs> There he is. There you the go. Boy, he's back. All right. But yeah, so to, to get back into it, nothing happened for those viewing the <laughs> video on demand. There definitely wasn't a couple of minutes that we edited out of the podcast not actually working properly. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, so that was that was my take was I think Gary left very soon after they arrived to go and get help and, you know, for whatever reason, got, got lost. But I think where the, you know, where a lot of people disagreed with me in our comment section and I've seen in the chat was that they think maybe Gary, you know, had a schizophrenic break and that he freaked out and, you know, either forced them all to leave the, the car thinking they were being followed or that he thought they were being followed and that's why they ended up on the mountain in the first place or possibly that once they arrived at the trailer, he, something happened and, and he, you know, caused, caused problems for everybody. I do think that part of that probably comes from a misunderstanding of how schizophrenia and medicated schizophrenia especially work. Because right. I, I don't know what I, at least what I was seeing was that Gary was probably going to be fine for a week or two without mm -hmm. his medication. And then it would slowly start to get worse. It wouldn't be like, right. like a psychotic break where one moment you're totally fine and the next you are totally delusional and violent. He would have slowly gotten worse. He would have progressed. So I, I think that was that was kind of one thing that that I saw a lot of people I think misunderstand about his his exact situation. But I was curious because you know in in doing the level of research you did, did it seem like there was some some alternative possibility there? Could Gary have have had some sort of mental episode happen? Well, the thing I, I thought about that, and it's a fair question. My only can my only thought was if Gary was going to have like a schizophrenic break. So they were able to drive from Marysville to Chico. And it seems like there was no incident with Gary in the car. They're at a basketball game for two hours. Doesn't seem like there was any incident in the game. And if Gary's having a psychotic break in the middle of a basketball game at a gymnasium, mm -hmm. someone or some people would have 
watch this unfold. And if they would have heard about the case, which they probably would have on the media, they would have called in and said, yeah, this guy was super sketchy at the basketball game. And he was mm-hmm. acting, he was acting a bit off and, you know, we didn't know what he was going to do, but no one ever talked to law enforcement. No one ever called and said, yeah, these guys at the game were acting super weird. And the guy that's a witness who sees the guys from across the gymnasium, who's actually the editor of the local newspaper in Chico, the only person that stands out is Ted Weir, because I think Ted was lounging a certain way in the chair and was just kind of nonchalant and sort of, you know, I don't want to say freeloading or whatever, but he was just, you know, having a good time at the game, but not causing any trouble. Right. And he said the guys were pretty reserved in their you know, cheering and they weren't like overly enthusiastic. So if Gary's having a psychotic episode, wouldn't there be more problems in the stands? Um, they go to Bears Market. No one, rem- the lady working there has no memory of Gary. Mm-hmm. The only person she remembers is Jackie Hewitt because he was standing next to the register just watching the other guys. So magically, Gary just has this incident as they get in the car and drive away. Like, right. and and I've, done some research you know there's people on youtube who live with schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder and they talk about their experiences with psychosis and hallucinations and when things go bad from what i understand in their experiences it's not like boom it just happened it's like you you kind of see uh, how do i say you kind of see the storm coming yeah like you like you know it's going to happen so if gary was have been a problem i don't think these guys would have had an issue pulling over, getting them out of the car, mm-hmm. calling someone and said, you need to come get Gary. Right. Or if it come, or if it came down to it, a guy like Ted Weir, who's definitely the strongest guy in the group, uh, known for not, I mean, he wasn't afraid for letting someone get his hands. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And uh, he could have grabbed Gary easily and tossed him out of the car right. if he was, you know, making him that angry. Cause you know, Dallas's family said, if you made Ted angry and if you were an adult, I mean, he'd come and clobber you. So if Gary's causing trouble, I don't know why they wouldn't have just pulled over somewhere, called his, try to call his family or call someone and say, you need to get this guy because we're not putting up with this. We're going to go home. We got a basketball game. And people said they were afraid of him. I, I don't buy that as well because, you know, for them to be in the gateway projects and working with being with around other people who may have had you know, certain disabilities or mental illness, it should have been known to them how they, you know, work well with others or deal with others. Um, so I'm, I'm not buying Gary having a mental breakdown. But the time that Gary spent in the trailer, I, I flip flop on that. I kind of think he got there and probably knew he's on the clock with his medication. And maybe there are times where I think Jack Madrug and Bill Sterling made it. And when Gary left, they probably thought he's not coming back and they they probably leave until jackie will be right back and then something happened they perish where they perish they might try walking back towards the car and then i do believe jackie's the last one in the trailer with mm. ted and he's either there when ted dies or things are going wrong and i think it's maybe too much for jackie and he decides to go get help so i think it's just all it's just this whole situation where people leave um and, and things are bad because in that trailer they found about what 30 sea ration mm-hmm. cans open yeah so people were eating the food people were opening the cans um someone had tried to light a candle in there no one had turned on the propane outside to heat the heat the trailer there was an adjoining trailer that they didn't get into to my knowledge i don't think they did but it also had enough food in it for you know, months. I mean, it was like dried food that they could have used. So figuring out how long Gary was up there is, is it's definitely up for debate. What I've always thought about is the fact that maybe Gary knew if he's not on his medication, it's, he might've known enough to say, I've got to go get help. That was my thing. Was, yeah if if you need help i need help too yeah he would he wouldn't have stuck around knowing that he would become a danger to his friends was my thinking and i don't also buy the idea that gary left and wandered off to, you know live off the land like he's some traveling you know uh homeless man because off his medication gary couldn't stay out of trouble and i i don't think gary 
could have done that. He couldn't have survived out that way without running into law enforcement yeah. or someone who would have gotten his fingerprints and they would have connected the dots easily saying, we got Gary Mathias here in this town and he's been arrested. Because yeah. off his medication, he just couldn't keep away from getting in trouble. There was always something going on. Now with his medication, life was a lot better and you don't see any problems with getting arrested like he was years before off his medication. Mm -hmm. So I think he probably understood how well he was doing or maybe was in a better place where he just decided it's time to go. Uh, these guys are in trouble. We need to get help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there, Aiden, do you have some? Yeah, I was just going to say another detail that was brought up there was the the propane. And Mattis, I know you and I have had uh, more than one discussion about the, the propane heat not being turned on. And Tony, I was curious if there was any indication from the research you've done as to why, whether A, they just didn't know it was there or B, they just didn't know how to use it. Uh, you know, why generally they wouldn't have turned it on. There's a few theories that they had with uh, law enforcement. Some felt if they went to that trailer towards the end of February and it, it had been snowing, snow could have covered parts of the propane tanks and it probably, they probably didn't dig through the snow to see where it attached to the trailer. It's also, they probably had no experience using propane heat in a trailer and they wouldn't know how to turn it on. Um, and I, I, there could have been some reluctance to even try to turn it on because it, I don't know how confident they felt in that or how much they understood on turning on the heat. But another thing they could have done is they, there was paperback books in the trailer. And I'm surprised none of them decided to say, hey, if we could build a bonfire or something, we could create a smoke signal of sorts. And if people could follow that, and if they smell something burning, um, that would definitely get people uh, their attention. Yeah, that didn't and even so, occur to me. Yeah, and there's a story in the book about some guys who got lost. And um, I don't know if they were in the Plumas or they were sort of in another national forest south of there. And they had a similar situation where they got lost in the snow. And they found a, a place that had a barn next to it. They set the barn on fire. They had enough matches and stuff to use as fuel. They set it on fire and all of a sudden investigators were like, what the hell is that? Something's on fire and they found the guys. Um, and they had been out for probably, I don't know, three, four days and Sheesh. they were in really bad shape. Yeah, I would imagine. I mean, it's that area when it comes to disappearances is a little too famous. Um, yeah, I mean, it's wild. Uh, the people that get lost there and even in other national um, parks and forests. I mean, you don't hear about it too much, but when you do, it's it's incredibly scary. Yeah. Yep. That's, uh... yeah. I'd... Hmm. You think yeah, even I... just for heat, too. Yeah, like, you, it would make sense. I, I know there was the consideration that they were concerned they would get in trouble if they did that. That, too. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that may have, at least for Weir and Hewitt, that may have been enough to give them pause and say, well... We shouldn't do that. Somebody will be angry at us for burning their stuff. Gary, on the other hand, you would expect probably would have thought to to do that and said, you know, yeah. consequences be damned. If we don't do this, we're going to die. Um, and that's the other thing is I feel like if Gary had been there as long as as a couple of weeks, long enough to eat, you know, a, a third of those sea rations. So we're going to say, you know, a, a week to 10 days, you would expect that he would have no having this the training of the army you would think that he would he would think ah smoke signal or you know which way was the road <laughs> like yeah there you would expect that if gary had time to get his bearings and that if he was there for a couple of weeks he and he remained lucid that he would have found a way to get them help i i agree i mean and they were they they could have something available either like a barrel or something where they could have put the books in there and set them on fire because there was a lull in the weather where they didn't have, I mean, they, for a while they had like rain, sleet, and mm -hmm. snow. But at one point they could have set something on fire and they had plenty of books to use. Um, but yeah, you're right. I think there was also a fear of getting in trouble. And that's why some people felt that the reason Ted lost so much weight, maybe not just due to the, his, his health, but also probably a 
moral compass that he had where it was like this is stealing because he once had a job somewhere where they gave him tips but he wouldn't accept the tips because he thought it was stealing because they would have all this extra money and they're like why do we have extra money in the cash register and they found out it was ted's tips and they said you know people have tipped you for the work that you've done and he thought that was stealing <laughs> and so some of the family members thought that too they thought well if ted sees the food that's not his does he think that's stealing yeah. but if gary's willing to break because they had to bust into that trailer and the person i think that would have done that would have been gary because he would have you know led that led those guys yeah. in there ted was too big and, to fit through the hole i think and jack probably didn't have the he, he was the the worst of all of them when it came to the disability they, they say he was but you know i'm talking to his family i mean they said jack jackie could you know hang with his brothers and his sister and you know go with the family fishing and hunting um i, I think that's one of those things they may have said in the press where it kind of got misconstrued a bit of how much of a disability he had gotcha. but i think you know gary would have been the one busting out the window and saying the hell with this we got to get in this trailer um but yeah it, it just gets back to who was there because we know gary's shoes are in the trailer uh his sister claimed that she saw some of his writing in the trailer jackie's dad claims that there was a like either a chalkboard or something where there were notes on it and he claims it was jackie's handwriting mm -hmm. so it definitely puts all three of those guys in the trailer we just don't have anything that puts jack madruga and bill sterling in the trailer because that is always debated whether those two actually made it or perished along the way part of me thinks they wouldn't leave anyone behind but when you got hypothermia and other issues going on with the weather and how it impacts your thinking mm -hmm. who knows what what state these guys were in at the time also if i remember correctly the way the relationships broke down bill and jack bill sterling and jack madruga were very close jack hewitt and ted weir were very close and gary was kind of you know just friends with all of them yeah gary knew probably knew ted weir the most out of all of them uh because they were neighbors so the hewitts or the hewitts the weirs and uh the matthiases knew of each other mm -hmm. probably more that but makes the sense parents... then that gary if you have a choice between trying to stay behind and save jack and bill versus going with ted that he would stick with ted and jack being attached to the hip to ted would have followed along yeah and you could have probably thought that well if he brought up brought, maybe he thought i'll bring ted and jackie to the trailer and then i'll go look for bill and uh jack maybe something went wrong there mm -hmm. and th that's how gary uh met his fate in the plumas it, it, there's so many scenarios to run over and i've talked to people about this a, a gazillion times and you just come up with all these ideas and new theories and scenarios and whatever and it this i always said that this story is a journey in the madness because the more you dig into it and try to figure these things out it just drives you crazy it really is wow. it's th this it is you know in a lot of ways i see why this is often called america's dyatlov pass you know we, we right. looked at dyatlov pass again a couple weeks ago and it's it's the same kind of thing where it's like all right we can yeah there's a lot about this that can be explained but the weird parts are that the stuff that can't be explained absolutely cannot be explained it's not right. like there's a few different possibilities and nobody's sure which it is. It's like we we really have no idea how this happened. Um, no. Which I think the, the most interesting part. The last thing I wanted to really quickly touch on before we go to the Q&A, mm -hmm. uh, and if you if you have Super Chats, if you have the, the way we do Q&A for anybody who's maybe new to it or you know has forgotten, hasn't been here in a while, is we go we take Super Chats first and then we'll fill out the rest of the time if there is time with uh, with the other the other questions that we see. So make sure that if you have any questions that you want to make sure they get answered, go ahead and then send those in now. And then if we have time after the super chats, we'll go through other questions and take us through to, uh, to eight, eight thirty, eight forty. All right. Um, Sounds good. yeah, the last thing I wanted to touch on was the gateway projects. Yeah. One more out there theory I saw was that, and again, I, I couldn't in the time I had, I couldn't find any evidence for this. But they had suggested that maybe that first of all the gateway project had actually been attacked i think um mm -hmm. a few years prior but also that you know maybe this was somebody who had an issue with gateway projects or had an issue with people who had disabilities and actually right. planned this whole thing out followed them to chico and then you know for some reason or another 
in some way manage to push them up into the plumus, either by chasing them or by, you know, posing as a figure of authority and saying, hey, we need to go here. Yeah, something like that. So I was curious, you know, was was there any any evidence of a connection between Gateway Projects and what happened to them? The only evidence I would say is that law enforcement tried to link the two events. Mm -hmm. So Gateway, the place where they went for job training, because it was for people with disabilities and mental illness, they could do job training and they kind of had like life coaches and there was athletics set up. Three years before they disappeared, it was the target of a few fire bombings. Mm -hmm. One of the buildings had been set on fire and then cars of people that had worked for Gateway had been set on fire. So that was the concern early on why are we being attacked is it because it's someone you know like a hate crime against mm -hmm. people with disabilities and then the director is murdered and he's killed by someone setting him on fire Sheesh. so okay you have and that murder was never solved to my knowledge mm -hmm. so you have all these horrible events it actually made it in the time magazine in the 70s where they were you know they had a piece about you know gateway being attacked <clears throat> so they thought early on, okay, if these guys, were they targeted by that same person? And I, I've talked to people about it before and they think, well, what if the guys knew or they found out who the person was that committed these crimes? Mm -hmm. And maybe that person got super paranoid and maybe they were linked to Gateway somehow where they had insider information that these guys were going to Chico and they tried to intercept them at some point. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's definitely a theory you can throw out there because that person was never captured. That yeah. person was never um, arrested. I know they had a suspect or suspects in mind, but they couldn't arrest the people because, you know, there's just not enough evidence. I know if you're familiar with that area, I don't know if you guys ever covered the Ketty Cabin murders mm -hmm. up there. We but, haven't I mean, covered them, but they did come up while I was researching. Yeah, I mean, so you have these crimes where you know, like someone was probably involved but you don't have the evidence to prove it. And with Gateway, could these guys have known the person or persons who were behind it? And maybe they were probably going to tell someone and they decided to go after these guys for doing that. You know, it could have been linked that way. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, there's really nothing fire related tied in with, with the men yeah. disappearing. So it would have um, been an, an MO issue, you think? Yeah, and I've often thought that did they know who was behind it, and mm -hmm. did they was someone afraid of these guys going to the cops and saying this is the person who's done all this stuff, and that person deciding to go after the guys because they knew they were going to that game, mm -hmm. and if they couldn't get them at the game, they would find a way to get them, but you'd have to do a hell of a job hunting these guys down on the highway to find them. Yeah. So I. I Unless you actually knew they were going to the game and waited, you know, waited at the game for them and then tra trace them. Exactly. And that's been brought up, too, if because we talked about Gary Mathias. He got in a couple of fights before, uh, or, let's see, November 77 and I think January 78. He got in a fight with a couple of people. One dude who people said was a legitimate tough guy and they're surprised Gary was still alive after the fight. Um could these guys have had bad blood with Gary and they probably had insider information too, where they could have followed him to the game. You're ex absolutely yeah. right. They could have waited in the parking lot, decided to hold off, you know, after they got on the highway and made their move. And if they knew who the guys were, they could have like flagged them down with like a ruse of something like, Hey, meet us in Oroville. What we're going to do. They probably would have said something where they knew the guys could trust them exit the highway and then once they got to orville they could have hatched a plan where it's like someone got in a car either with a gun or yeah or maybe took one guy took gary out of the car and they said follow us or just drive and these are all possibilities um that we've tried to come up with on getting the guys into orville and getting them up that road because you just don't drive straight up that road i mean it's so bizarre mm -hmm. Yeah, there was there was one other thing that I've seen some people reference in the chat that I, I couldn't recall necessarily how accurate it was. Um, I know that there were suggestions that Joseph Shones had a daughter or a friend's daughter who had gone to Gateway Projects for a couple of things and might have known the boys, and that something may have happened between her and one of the boys. Was that 
true or was it that one of the i what i remembered i feel like was that shones was in some way connected i think through his daughter in sacramento that something had happened with his daughter while she was in sacramento but that it didn't necessarily involve gateway projects or the five boys right he did have he does he did have a daughter with a disability but from what they found she never went to the gateway projects mm -hmm. she was down probably sacramento way um or in another town and they found no link between her and the guys but the guys also traveled to sacramento for another i i think they had i'm sorry i think they had another program in the area called alta alta mm -hmm. And they may have had an office in Sacramento. The guys may have had to go to Sacramento in the past. It was a similar style program. So I think they were linked through both. Mm -hmm. And if they could link her through Alta, possibly, or yeah. Shones through Alta, maybe with these guys, there could have been something there. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, for that car to be abandoned on the road where Shones is located, that's like, oof. I mean, what are the odds that those yeah. guys meet on the same road that time of day mm -hmm. or that time of night sorry yeah. that's that's the one thing that sticks with me that that i guess i'm sitting here like i wonder could could the real angle actually be more conspiratorial could it be that you know somebody at gateway somebody working for gateway could have been behind the bombings it could have been somebody who really did hate disabled people and in order to get close to them so that he could cause them trouble he or she could cause them harm could end up getting a job there that could make it so that you were aware of where they would be at a given time. And if it were an authority figure, somebody they had trusted, if that person showed up outside of the game and said, you know, Hey guys, you know, I know you were planning to head home tonight, but you know, why don't you, you follow me? There's this, uh, you know, this really cool place I want to show you. We'll be back in time for the game tomorrow or something like that. I do wonder. Yeah. And I, I you know, I don't know. How did, I guess that, that was one thing I never thought to look into. How did their coach react when they didn't show up? Oh, that's a good, and I definitely put it in the book. Um, so the coach and the guys were supposed to meet at a department store, downtown Marysville, like mm -hmm. 8 a.m. on Saturday. They'd probably get in a bus or something and drive down to Sacramento for the tournament. Ted Weir's sister-in-law went to that place to look for him and mm -hmm. nobody was there. So she thought, okay, they probably already went to Sacramento, but it's strange they never stopped at home because none of them had their uniforms. So they find out that the coach actually never made it to the meeting point himself. He actually drove straight to the game in Sacramento because he said he was running late that day, but didn't offer an excuse why. And when law enforcement talked to him, they said he seemed pretty nonchalant about the whole event. But I do know someone that has talked to the coach uh since and the coach said that he had been actually contacted by family members that morning but, but with the, the family members seem to say that they didn't know they never talked to the coach they claim they never talked to the coach but when the coach talks to law enforcement in 78 he's kind of nonchalant because he said when we had all our problems at gateway three years ago you guys law enforcement didn't do any due diligence that on our beat or we thought we thought you guys would <clears throat> kind of have that same attitude towards this that you really didn't care because you didn't really care when our cars were getting you know set on fire and we were the targets of a firebombing and you haven't solved that murder so i think it was a real testy situation between him and law enforcement but law or, enforcement oh go ahead you know i have to wonder about the possibility he's late that morning for reasons he doesn't explain to anybody he lies right. and says that a family member told him that the boys weren't going to be there he drives to sacramento without checking to see where they are it entirely sounds like he knew they wouldn't be there and he needed to be in sacramento for the alibi like and if it's he were worse, yeah. he would have known that they were going to see the basketball game in chico he would have been a, an authority figure who because the the one thing that i kept seeing come up over and over again was like well, they were so excited about this game. There is no reason that they would have missed this game. Nothing could possibly make them miss this game. But the one thing I'm thinking that could make them decide to do something that could theoretically jeopardize their game, the one person who I could see saying something to them would be the coach. Because if they're 
basketball coach says, hey, don't worry about it. Well, I'll make sure we're all there in time. They might go, oh, well, he's our basketball coach. He knows right. how the basketball game works. This will all be fine. So I, I do, that does give me pause. And I, I wonder, you know, is that something that could possibly deserve a second look? Is, does the basketball coach have any other weirdness going on? You know, it seems like, it, it seems like what you would say if the cops asked, you know, well, why didn't you, why weren't you concerned? You don't say, well, you guys didn't care the last time. I mean, if we look at other right. disappearances that we've covered, especially with, I know these aren't children, but they are, you know, adult men of lower intellectual capability off. And they're referred to as the boys in most cases. Often these are people who are going to be, you know, kind of treated as children. So you would think that, you know, we looked at a lot of other cases, for example, uh, Bobby Beezup. He was a 12 year old boy scout, went missing in the Uintah mountains down in Utah, uh, east of Salt okay. Lake city. He goes missing and he's on a, an unsanctioned, but, uh, Boy Scout organized trip. So his Boy Scout troop organized an end of the summer camping trip. It wasn't an official Boy Scouts trip. So the, the Scout Master wasn't there. It wasn't official BSA uh, organization, but it was his Scout troop. When the, uh, when the Scout Master found out that he was missing, I think it was a Friday morning, the Scout Master immediately got up, left work and drove an hour into the mountains to go and look for the kid. Um, and that's kind of what we see in most of the cases where, a, an authority figure who's not a direct relative finds out that somebody right. they're supposed to care for is missing. Typically when they're not involved in the disappearance, they drop everything and go running, whether it's a godfather, a coach, a teacher, a chaperone. Usually the response is to go and help out if somebody is not right. where they're supposed to be. The coach's, you, you response, make a very good point. the coach's response is is weird to me for that reason. I would expect that if these were kids that he was coaching, that he was seeing every, you know, not maybe not every day, but he was seeing these guys frequently. He was aware of how enthusiastic they were. The only way that I could see a grown adult, a grown functional adult saying, ah, it's nothing to worry about is if they knew it was nothing to worry about or if they had contempt for the people who were missing. So I, I do wonder if that's worth a second look. I think, I mean, it, it was at the time they, they talked to him and they said he was pretty nonchalant, but someone actually got a hold of the coach and talked to him. His, his memory was, I was told that morning they weren't, they hadn't come home from the basketball game. And that's why I was running late because I was talking to some of the family members. Now that wasn't in the report, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's very interesting from what the report says and then someone talking to him years later um it, it's still it i mean it's still a bit interesting what happened there with the coach so um did they consider him a person of interest they didn't really leave any information in the notes other than we just talked to this guy but they talked to someone who was sort of a special uh, like special education teacher at the time and she said if you look at these guys, someone, like you said, someone with a, in a, in a position of authority or someone they trusted could tell them like, Hey, we need to do, we need to do this. You know, I need you to come with me. And they yeah. would have been like, Oh, okay. But you know, they also said, you know, someone pointing a gun at them saying, we're going to do this. You're going to come with me. That was also one of those things where they're like, okay, uh, we got to do this. Um, and, and they've, they've tried to, you know, law enforcement tried to, plug either one in like was it someone they knew or maybe someone who presented themselves in a certain way where they assumed they were a person of authority a person that they could trust and then or that person may have promised them something where it got their attention and they wanted to help or if it was just someone coming out of the blue and threatening them yeah i mean it, it's it's definitely one of the two and it we know it probably would have gone down in oroville because it's the place where if things are going to go into motion, that's where it would be going down, would be the town of Boroughville. And they would have got on the highway to either flee from these guys or they were, you know, told to go a certain way up the Oroville Quincy Highway or threatened to go that way. Like, you got to go this way and you got to follow us or we're going to follow you and don't do anything stupid. Yeah, it's. I... It's frustrating. Yeah. It, it's just the most confusing. It is one of the most confusing cases I've ever looked at. 
Yeah, and people try to use like they say Occam's razor, you know, the the most um what what I want to say, like the most obvious the, uh, answer. It's the answer is. the solution with the fewest number of assumptions. Yeah, and and with that, I mean, okay, they got lost, but if Jack Madruga is a guy that can drive to Sacramento, he can drive to Chico, he doesn't have any history of getting lost. They don't have any stories from the parents like, oh yeah, these guys would get lost all the time every time they went somewhere. No one says that. Um and you drive this, if you take the route through Oroville to the place where they abandoned the car, you're just going to sit and say to yourself, this is yeah. wrong. This is wrong. Because if you watch the show, Files of the Unexplained, I'm with the film crew and we drive up that way. And they're mm -hmm. like, there's no way these guys got lost. I mean, they, they just felt like this, this is way out of character. And I know another, uh, other people that have gone up that way. And they said, this is the strangest drive. There's, a, there's no way you can say oh, we're going to, we're lost. You can turn around plenty of places mm -hmm. and get back to where you were. And it, it's, it's something I just don't buy. Like something was going on, something went down. It was something bad was happening. And I think they knew it, it was, it was a very serious situation. I don't know what their plan was or how they thought they could get out of it, but something got them from point A to point B and yeah. Everything just went wrong from there. And if Shones wasn't involved, he probably saw what happened and could have been threatened. Yeah. And, and that's another scenario I have in my head where they probably told this guy, you do anything, you say anything, you're a dead man. Yep. But he had to, I think, he had to tell people something. Yeah, because people saw his car up there and he, he probably felt like, oh, well, if other people saw me up there, this isn't good. Mm -hmm. um and i'd have to explain my way out of that and so he probably just talked himself into a, a web of bs like he was known for so it's, it's very frustrating i know we yeah. talked a little bit about the possibility of somebody chasing him up there but do we even want to discuss the the red truck thing i think we like briefly mentioned it earlier it's just kind of yeah, weird I mean, like it comes up in shown's story but and, and then also in the Brownsville story, but from what I understand, yeah. there was never any, like, I think it was Shones, was it that Shones said something and then the Brownsville story came out? Yes. So I think they, those stories were happening around the same time and we're trying to figure out who said what first. Mm -hmm. um, so we think it was Shones first, then the Brownsville story, but it's interesting that there's a pickup truck involved and a red pickup truck. Um, it's really weird. Like how are, there's no way those to like Shones and the people at the market are connected. But where are you getting this red pickup truck? I mean, did it come through the media? Did it come through a newspaper? I th I, I thought he did a pretty good job combing through the papers and Wonder finding if the information. Wonder owned a red pickup truck. Uh, no, he didn't. Um, I, I was trying to remember if they said something, someone said something about his car, but it wasn't the coach that had a pickup truck because um, he was one of the people that actually had his car set on fire by the person that attacked the gateway. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't think he had a truck, Gotcha. but um, there have been theories about people in town with a truck or new people with a truck that mm -hmm. were involved in chasing the men up into the plumas. And that's a whole different story. Yeah. I just... All, all theories, but not definite 100% fact. Yeah. It's all just so strange. But we are now way over time to go to super chats. So yes, uh, let's uh, let's cut this at probably eight forty-five based on how many I saw in here. Uh, yeah, there's not many. Sure. Yeah, there's not. But yeah, you know, happens. Uh, all right. <laughs> well, Aiden, you want to read us through? You got it. Yeah, the first one's from Kellen. The official data for five dollars and fifty-six cents. Love the specificity <laughs> coming at us from the beginning of the show, saying, "Holy hell, the Lore Lodge has a podcast now! Hell yeah, boys, get that paper." <laughs> yeah, Thanks, we just Kellen. started it. It's brand yep. new. <laughs> Never before. Uh, and then totally not JMO for $10. I got the name correct this you time because I remembered uh, saying, oh, good Lord... God. <laughs> would you like me to read it? Um, uh, it's Lord Time, boys. I'm waiting for the eclipse in Vermont. It's beautiful. The Berserk reference goes hard. Uh, Aiden the Windisty is calling me and I will burn it with napalm. Fear me. Followed up by another one for $5 saying, also got nearly stuck snowmobiling. Almost became a 411 case. Luckily, I had my bud save me. 
Uh, also, can we get in a woo? We haven't gotten one in months. I believe, Mattis, would you just go get the boy? Or uh, I just took psychic damage from those those chats. Yeah, I, I, think, I, I am, figured you would. I, I feel like I feel like I just had multiple confusion spells cast upon me. Um, <laughs> as for the boy, really quick. Hey, Amanda? Is the boy here? The boy is not here. Ah, so I... Uh, he may be here before the end of the show, in which case you will get your Awu, has that sound. They love they love hearing my, my tiny little dog howl. He's <laughs> this big, but he howls like a wolf. Sounds good. It's adorable. Next up is from Ryan Whitcup for $7.23, saying, Woo! glad to have you boys grace my ears live. Always enjoyable to hear you guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, and then, yeah, we can, now we got some more coming in. Uh, yep. Kelly, official data for $10 says, where can we find your book? And is there an audio book coming, Tony? So the book, Things Aren't Right, The Disappearance of the Yuba County Five is at Amazon. <clears throat> you can also uh, order from Genius Book Publishing. And if you do get from Amazon, there is a Kindle version and there is definitely um, a softback edition. But we are talking about an audio book. Uh, what we're what I'm learning is how the whole process of creating an audiobook goes. It is far more <laughs> in, in depth than um, I knew and more costly than I knew. So working 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 with the publisher and getting some ideas. Um, we are looking at some options right now. So we're hoping sooner than later having an audiobook. I know some sites do reading through AI and we don't want to do it that way. We'd rather have yeah, I know. A real person behind the microphone doing the reading because sometimes the AI sounds a little bit too much like this. And it's, that's it's, not fun. It's getting good, but it's still not quite there for sure. It's not fluid. It's not good. No, no, but yeah, Amazon's the good place to get things aren't right. And if you have Kindle Unlimited, you can definitely you can, get the Kindle for free. Um, and definitely, you know, get the paperback. If you got Prime, you can definitely get it sooner than later. Ah, well, Archie's here. <laughs> Um, what I was going to do is I can go to Amazon and I can actually grab a link. Book's $5, correct? Uh, 15 or 15, 17, 15, like that. 17? Four dollars. I think it's like $5. Uh, it's it's, it's Kindle. probably the Kindle edition. That's $5. Yeah, Kindle's yeah, about $5. But if you have Kindle Unlimited, I think you can read it for free. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy that link pop myself into studio really quick so I can go over to the stream and I'm going to pop the link get thing, uh, things while you aren't right while you drop that and pin that uh, totally not Jamer for $2.39 uh, is saying that he Truly needs the milk because uh, his bones are not uh, structurally sound without it. Uh, and then uh, Losbury, Losbury, tell me if I'm right or wrong on either of those Sound pronunciations right. for one ninety nine. Saying uh, no question, just a donation. Nice to meet you. Well, you... Right. Nice to meet you. Thank you. And then the most recent one is from Cakes for four ninety nine. Saying, boys and Mister Tony, what's your favorite unsolved mystery? And I think it'd be really entertaining if it wasn't the one you just wrote a book about. <laughs> well, definitely Yuba County Five is my favorite, but the other ones are like, you know, D.B. Cooper, Zodiac. Um, I, I, there was another disappearance that did happen um, in one of the California National Parks. His name was Jared Negretti. He was um, a Boy Scout. I know you just mentioned that, Aiden. Um, but his is kind of similar to what happened to the, I don't know if you're familiar with the Lost Girls of Panama. The two, yeah, uh, it was two tourist girls, right? Yeah, they got lost, but there's all these strange pictures on their phone. But Jared at the time, this is way before cell phone technology, he actually had his camera and he was taking pictures of himself and he got lost and was never found in the woods. I mean, Yuba County 5 still top for me, but I, I still have plenty of other uh, unsolved cases that I do follow and, you know, we'll listen to a podcast about them and read books on them. So, uh, but Yuba County 5 is number one. I'm not taking that off my list. 
Archie. One question I saw, just because uh, it's slightly relevant, but I know we, we suggested the idea that they were potentially uh, chased up there as an option. And one thing that I saw somebody comment, I can't remember who it was, uh, that might give credence to that idea, is that the, the reason they may not have started a fire beyond any difficulties understanding the propane and whatnot is that if they were chased, maybe they had a fear that they would be discovered in their hiding spot right. uh, through a fire. That has been brought up as well because some people that I've talked to said, you know, they didn't really, it, they might have been afraid if they did set a fire that someone that told them to, you know, go up and be gone would come back and find them and do something to them. So they probably felt they were still hiding from someone. I mean, it's a very good point. And we don't really have any, um, have any proof for that. But it is a good point, and we've definitely thought about that in doing research for the case. That makes sense. So, very scary. What do you think is the, I guess this is just really a question for me, is the most overlooked section of the case from all the work that you've done? Ooh, most overlooked. Um, probably in understanding who they were individually as people. I, I think that gets overlooked, like they get in the car and they get lost, but I don't think there's enough said about who they were as people and their stories. I think that really needs to, that's something I really tried to do with the book is <clears throat> give everyone more of a backstory of all the five. So you have, you know, more about them, what they liked, what they wanted to do with their lives, you know, some of their favorite hobbies and, you know, some of the adventures they went on in life. So. I think that's probably been the most overlooked part. That makes sense. I mean, it also, you know, gives a lot more reasons to why to care about the case, you know, when you really exactly. get to know who they are. Yeah, it, it's really interesting to to know more about them. And I think that was huge um, because you just know a little bit about them, like, oh, they like basketball and then they got lost and they had disabilities and someone had schizophrenia. But with this book, you kind of learn about more about who they were and their lives and the ups and downs that they all had and, um, you know, great stories that family members had to share some you know are pretty heartwarming some are pretty funny so that, that was good to add to the book and that, uh, that's definitely overlooked in this case nice yeah i to to answer the question myself um i'm still really confused by tom messick i am mm. i am i think that one will that is going to be that could be my white whale <laughs> Actually, which one we're going to go messick? back up Tom Messick uh, was an 82-year-old hunter and uh, 82nd Airborne veteran who went missing in uh, just outside of Brant Lake, New York, um, in 2015. It was the, I want to say, either the week or two weeks before Thanksgiving, I think November 15th, 2015, um, just vanished. Um, he was 100 yards from another hunter um they were doing a deer drive and they all got called back in after a couple hours and tom never came back he also never called for help on his walkie talkie they never found any of his clothes they never found his rifle they didn't find any they didn't find the wrapper from his snickers bar like there, no sign hmm. of the guy and you know he was he was half blind half deaf you would expect that if he didn't if something happened and he he had a medical emergency or something like that or he just wandered off this isn't a guy who should have survived to get out past the roads. Like at a certain point, he either should have found a road and then he would have been safe or he should have been found inside the search area, which covered, I think like seven or eight square miles all between roads. So if he had made it to a road, he would have been, he would have had help. If he didn't make it to a road, he would have been found. Yeah. And if he realized he was lost, he should have called for help on his walkie talkie. Like there's just no reason to, it's very difficult to understand what happened to the guy and his, his remains were never found. And then literally a week later, uh, this guy, Fred drum goes missing 40 miles South. Same thing. Um, just huh. vanishes. Nobody finds his cell phone or I think his cell phone was left at home, but nobody finds his, his clothes. Nobody finds anything he brought with him. No remains, nothing. Um, so and, that's just and, like, I, I just really have no idea what could have happened. And when Mattis and I went up there a couple of years ago, just to that area of Brant Lake to try and kind of get a little bit better of an understanding about it, you know, thinking about how close one of the other hunters were, if something wrong had happened, uh, we tested it while we were up there to see, you know, with that distance, 
uh, you know, if he called out to somebody, would they have heard him? And not only would they have likely heard him if he had yelled out, but Mattis went about 100 yards into the woods, probably a little bit further. And we were able to have a conversation at a conversational level yeah. and Ooh. hear each other perfectly clearly up there. Not even a so, yell, just like talking like we were across the room from each other at a coffee shop. Yeah. And that's kind of strange because it gets back to the, the Yuba County Five, just the strange disappearances in you know, woods, national parks, forests, whatever you want to say. I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg of a lot of these tales. And everyone is just so haunting and, and heartbreaking that it, these really do not make sense. These nope. stories of people going into the woods and disappearing. I mean, it, it's real. And these are just a few examples and why people are really interested in these stories, just because there is this fear of being lost in the woods. And I mean, it's it, it's unfortunately it yeah. happened to too many people and it, it's the strangest thing because we've we've covered so many of these at this point probably probably a few dozen and maybe I, i'll say this much one in ten probably turns out to be genuinely baffling like we find at the very least a plausible explanation for 90 percent of the cases we look at but that one in ten is still like what what happened here <laughs> Who, right Somebody knows something, but it, they're either not coming forward or there's no good explanation. And, you know, this is the, the Yuba County five one is definitely one of the ones I consider up there. Dyatlov pass being another, yeah. um, you know, uh, was Aaron Garrett Hedges Barnsley. up there for you too? Aaron Hedges turned out uh, to be rather explicable because he was detoxing from uh, alcohol. Right, right. He was an alcoholic and uh, he was detoxing. So he was on, um some benzodiazepines but he was also drinking while he was up there it was a mess his friends definitely didn't do what they should have been doing they were poaching like the, that whole case is a complete mess uh but yeah there's it's just weird but uh yeah there are a few more super chats that we need to get yep. to before we end the show yes we got another one from uh lost for 199 says mattis is my name right every time do you want to try saying it to prove him right uh los Bri. there we go we'll see if you're right i think uh los Bri or los Bri? Now I'm second guessing both myself. Yeah, I don't know. We'll find out. Uh, Ryan Wick up again for five dollars seventeen cents. Love the specificity. He says I feel like this case shows how misunderstood developmental disorders can be, especially with the theories pointing the finger at Gary because of his schizophrenia. Yeah, right. That was definitely yeah, it's, it's it. true. And people don't always understand these. You know, they don't understand mental illness or developmental disabilities, and it's easy to dismiss people or to make them the villain. Yeah, and if you go back and you look too at like. The news reports you can really tell that they, there was not mm -hmm. a ton of they, they they really didn't even differentiate them all that much it was just nope. and, and they all had disabilities they, they also they also don't even note that gary was not intellectually disabled they if you right. look at most of the headlines they say and keep in mind i i am using dated language because it's what the headlines said but the headlines all say five retarded men missing things like that right. where it's you know, it, sometimes it says mildly and not just, you know, straight retarded, but still you can, they're not differentiating. It's not, well, all right, well, you know, two of them have been diagnosed as uh, mentally uh, disabled. Uh, two are just kind of like agreed by their families to be slow. And then Gary's not disabled at all. Gary's, Gary's schizophrenic. You don't get that, uh, that breakdown in any not of the reporting all. from the time. Yeah. And that unfortunately hurt the case because using that word, I mean, you may have probably, they probably wanted to use it for, I don't know, sympathy or maybe raising like alarms. But I think it also made people apathetic to the case where they're like, oh, well, that's, well, there you go. They all have disabilities and are handicapped and it's their own fault. They got lost and they're not smart. And, mm. you know, they, who let them go to a game by themselves. And, um, but, what they don't see is in the backstory of these guys, like the day before the game in Chico, they drove to Sacramento the day before for basketball practice. So, and they've made many trips to Sacramento. They made many trips to Chico. So what's going on here? You know, if they can do the trip and it doesn't matter the time of day, why is there now suddenly a problem? So if the trips are no problem, but this one trip becomes a problem, what's the problem and people just want to say well you know they got lost but yeah. if you take the roads 
and you follow the the Oroville Quincy Highway up into the Plumas, you've got a lot of time to think I'm not going back to Marysville because those roads are straight and it's pretty flat and you might see like houses and some of the orchards and groves that they have there for agriculture but up in the plumas it's just like pine trees rocks and winding roads and yeah, snow and you know there. yeah you know this is wrong this is the wrong way home and we're in a lot of trouble yeah all right well we've got our last looks like three super chats that i want to hit uh before we before we finish up for the night so in you want to read those off it was Echo you got it. uh yep uh echo warrior from 499 says sorry just got off work love the content guys can't wait to watch uh back the stream also mel nadel is one of one you should cover mel nadel i, I assume that's nadel but yeah pop it on the list yeah we will do uh and then lost bobcat Pari. it is lost per eye i i, I second guess myself and i i screwed up i'm always uh, right the first time i gotta stop questioning myself <laughs> Bobcat, who's been a member for a month, thank you very much for that, uh, says, given the time, location, and mental health connections, could it have been an MK Ultra cover-up? Uh, um, I, I've heard that. Yeah. People have brought it up, but to me, no, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, people have thought about UFOs, and maybe they tried to chase it, or maybe it was something like that. I, I've heard MK Ultra a few times, but it just doesn't seem to be something you can plug into this case. I, yeah. I wouldn't, there, there's some cases where people have worked for the government and they've had ties to like the military and like the CIA and FBI and stuff. And some super strange things have happened to these people where it's beyond questionable. These guys, I'm not putting them in that ballpark. I, I just don't think that's MK ultra territory. The only one of them who would have, kind of qualified for the, the MK Ultra profile here would have been Gary, I think. Um because if you look at yeah. you know, if you look at who does have MK Ultra ties, it's guys like Charles Manson, Ked Kaczynski, like people who are already known to be a little bit like a little bit volatile and and out there, but also they're targeting people who are at least of average intelligence here. Manson I think had an IQ of around 95. Kaczynski on the other hand is, you know, just super, super intelligent. Uh, but you know, if you look at it, Gary would be the only one who MK Ultra would would really apply to, and he doesn't fit the profile otherwise. If you look at Manson, yeah. Manson, when he was being treated for his mental health issues, the treatment was that he was given as much LSD as he wanted, and also instructed to give it to you know the women who were living in his commune. Like the it was a it, Gary was on medication. He was working. He yeah. was. You know, he was a stand-up member of society. It just doesn't, it doesn't fit. And he was opinion. probably, he was, and he was under the watchful eye of his family. Yeah. Um, so he, at that time, yeah, he had ties to the military, but not Gary. I just don't see any ties to that. I, I know it's been brought up, but with Gary, like I said, there's some other cases where people have made the connection with MK Ultra. This one just doesn't fit the bill. There's yeah, nothing about Gary. Yeah. Real quick before we get to the last one from Jack Everfree, uh, Mattis, JMO did ask you if you've listened to Nano War of Steel yet. No. There you go. So the last one's from Jack. That. Yes. Uh, Jack <laughs> Everfree for 999 says, have you all looked into the guy from North Texas, South Oklahoma, who disappeared after trying to call the police and his brother? Might be related to the Wilson, Oklahoma disappearances. I have uh, Brandon. Brandon Lawson or Brandon Swanson? He, Brandon there's... Brandon Swanson we've covered. I think that's Brandon Minnesota, Lawson, right? Brandon Lawson would be the one I think that they're talking about because I know, yeah, uh, the Lawson I know case. another another one of our viewers who who does uh, similar content to what we do. Bert Moran he has a video, a series of videos I think on Brandon Lawson. So um, that would be something to look into for sure. And also, uh, Bert, I know I saw you were in here earlier. Um, if you would want to come on and, and talk through that case with us, we'd be happy to have you. So I, uh, and that's one of those missing persons cases. Both of those I'm really interested in as well. Uh, but the, it was the Lawson case with the strange 911 call mm -hmm. because you can kind of hear someone else in the background and maybe a gunshot. So, and, and that case, I mean, talk about an, a, a lot to that one. That's sketchy. All right. Yeah. That's uh, that's something we'll that's another into. time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, this, uh, you know, we, we got the, uh, we, we had great viewership for this. You know, I, I am, awesome. I, I learned a lot. Um, 
Likewise. This this definitely it, it tied up some loose ends, and I think if we if we revisit the Yuba County case uh, at any point in the future, I there's definitely some stuff that came out of this conversation that I think would get shoved in there. And I I want to I want to take a second look at this coach. Um, yeah, I mean it it's it's um it it it's interesting um about that, but. Again, I mean, is there enough to say that something did they what they knew, or maybe they just had a bad? Some people just have a bad attitude towards cops in general, oh, and and maybe that didn't sit too well with law enforcement. And then, um, yeah, it it's it's just another part of this case where you go, okay, I'm going to go down this rabbit hole now, yeah. and I'm going to follow this lead. But then you start to think about it, and you go, well, but you know, there's this as well. And so it, it's what's interesting about the Yuba County five case. And I'm glad the lore lodge did a good job with your oh, video. You. I mean, that's what I really liked about the YouTube video and why I reached out because I like getting in touch with people who are dedicated to the case and other missing persons cases and other unsolved mysteries. And they're doing their research and getting the facts together to find out what really happened. And so I really appreciate this opportunity. That was oh, awesome. Well I, I appreciate the praise. You know, it, it means a lot. Yes, yeah. that's, that's what we try to do. Is we want to want to take a look at mysterious content with a factual angle rather than a hey, look at this creepy thing that happened angle. <laughs> um, right. You know, some some people have been a little bit too off with the Yuba County Five, but I'm always glad to talk to people who want to take a look at everything and try to get as much information and learn more. Yeah. And hopefully, with the book, it jogs someone's memory and gets some information out there. Yeah, I'll definitely. I'm. Um, I'm going to suggest that uh, a couple other people we've talked to and we, we routinely work with and ask them to take a look at it. Maybe I'll send them copies. Please. Yeah. Any eyes on the case and any information that people can come up with. I mean, it's, it's always welcome because it's, it's going to get this sort of blank space of what happened on the ride home until they got to the Plumas. Why did all this happen and how did this all sort of turn into chaos for these guys that night? Yep. All right. Well, Tony, um, you know, it, this was a great conversation. I'm so glad we did this. I, uh, I, I, and as I said, I haven't finished uh, reading the book all the way through, like, you know, in from start to finish yet, but I, I skipped around, read some chapters. It's well-written. It is informative. Um, and so far as I could tell you, you really did your, you, you did your due diligence. So highly well, recommend you. you guys take a look at it again, the Kindle edition, it seems like is only four fifty. Uh, the, the actual physical copy you said was 15 or so, I think. 15, 17, I don't remember yeah. that. I think it's 17 up, up 16, 17 at Amazon. Sometimes gotcha, yeah. they lower the price. So keep an eye and um, whatever you know you want to do. Uh, yep. Thanks for supporting the book and independent publishing. Yeah, so very, very reasonable price for a book, guys. And I, I, I popped in the description and up at the top of the chat right now, you'll see a link that will take you to an Amazon store page. You can buy it right there um you know get it get it delivered immediately if you've got a kindle or i assume it's probably prime so a couple of days if not absolutely all right tony is there anywhere people can find you aside from amazon um i'm on uh twitter uh so you can look under uh, tony doug Wright. uh you can also look for tony Wright author on instagram uh or tony doug Wright on facebook all right well thank you so much for joining us and I, uh, you know, I, if, if we have a, a reason to have you on again, we'll definitely reach out to, to do some updates and I'm, I'd be glad to join I, you. I would love to know, uh, you know, if, if there's anything that if people reach out and they're like, Hey, this got me thinking about this, please let us know. We'd love to love to revisit yeah. and, you know, maybe get you and uh, Nick from missing enigma on at the same time. Um, hey, that'd be, that'd be a hell of a brain trust up here. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> I think so. All right. Sounds and. Awesome. To the viewers of whom there were nearly a uh, thousand concurrently tonight, hell yeah! First first show back in a couple of, and almost yeah, first show back in what over a month? Yeah, about like five or six weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah killing it. Thank you guys. Thank <laughs> you so much for hanging out. Um, hope you like the show. If you did, please hit the like button and consider hitting the share button as well. And make sure you have that notification bell pressed so that anytime a new video goes live or anytime we post an update on the community section, you uh, can you know you can get. A, a notification about it i guess um the other thing is that members of the channel it's five dollars a month to be a member members of the channel get one free super chat every month that kicks in after your first month so that is something to consider if you uh, are a frequent super chat sender um you know 
get get yourself a membership to the channel, get access to some of the exclusive content that we have coming. There's going to be an exclusive live stream where Aiden and I uh, drink and then talk about history and folklore. Um, so that's going to be coming to Patreon and YouTube members only, which means that YouTube membership gets you a free super chat and access to that content every month. That is all I have to say for the show tonight. Aiden, am I missing anything? Not that's relevant. Do we want to talk about the video that'll be coming out this coming Friday? Oh yeah. It's on the flat earth. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's going to be something I, I have been in pain all week. <laughs> so I've or for those who are still still here, uh, the the amount of like genuine pain that I have heard from this man's voice when he has called me to either just like go over something or we had to schedule something otherwise, and I would check in and just be like, "Hey, how's the flat Earth research going?" And he's just like, "There's just so many problems." So I look forward to watching him give the lecture to me before I, before I edit, and I'm looking forward for everybody getting an opportunity to see it on Friday. Oh wait, I promised them. I promised them an awu from Archie. Oh, that's true. You got to do the. Give me one second, Tony. <laughs> Sorry. Also, yeah, you. Tony. In, in addition to uh, what Madison was saying, Madison get that. But yeah, if there's any other cases beyond the Yuba County Five that you'd ever want to discuss, uh, feel free to let us know. Because uh, yeah, you know, we always like getting a second opinion uh, on a variety of different things. And you know, obviously, with your research capabilities and and you know, good head on your head on your shoulders, it seems. Uh, I think you yes. have a lot of good takes about some of the stuff that we cover here. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I follow a lot of uh, true crime and unsolved mysteries, so. Always love talking about that and uh, definitely appreciate the time you guys have had with me tonight. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. All Thank right. you. And uh, since this was requested, uh, Archie, can I get a... Ow, ow. Give me one second to get him going. <laughs> make, sure, uh, make sure it's coming through. Get rid of the filters. All right, you two. There you go. All right, you two. The both of you. The both of you. That's enough. Good boy. I know, I know. All right, hop down, buddy. The audience loves that. <laughs> <laughs> chat loves the awu section. All right. Yeah, the, the, the entire chat is just awu. Yep. All right. Tony, thank you so much. It has been thank so you guys. nice to chat with you. And hopefully we can talk to you again at some point. Likewise, thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Awesome show. Appreciate all the work you do. Of course. Likewise. Right. And chat, we will see you guys on the next one. Bye, guys.